the frustration, anxiety, and depression of people who've suffered of these brain injuries where, again, you don't see the physical symptoms. Uh, you don't see them. That's why they're described sometimes as invisible injuries. But it has affected this person so completely that they are a changed person. How common are brain injuries resulting from a truck crash and are symptoms always obvious right away? We're going to find out right now on this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest is attorney Michelle West. I want to remind you, if you want to ask Michelle questions about your situation, it's easy. Go to askthelawyers.com, click the button up top that says Ask a Lawyer, or you can always call the phone number you'll see at the top of the screen. Michelle, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about what your experience is representing clients who have sustained a brain injury after an 18-wheeler truck accident. Sure. So, you know, typically when there's a brain injury in an 18-wheeler truck accident, um, unfortunately, that's going to be a pretty serious brain injury in my experience, um, just because of the differential and the, the size of the vehicle that usually my clients are in versus the size of the of the a large uh, tractor trailer vehicle. Um, so these are going to be, you know, unfortunately, as several come to mind, you know, loss of consciousness for several days, um, uh, tr just a traumatic brain injury with loss of, of function and complete loss of um, ability to do the types of things that these people were able to do before the incident. Um, so they are, you know, typically a uh, pretty catastrophic brain injury with obvious physical um, symptoms and uh, mental symptoms. So you're going to have loss of memory, loss of consciousness, coma for several days. Um, you know, those are, those are obvious ones. Uh, then there are also uh, sort of less obvious physical symptom brain injury cases. Um, and I have several of those I'm handling right now. And uh, one, in fact, on behalf of a, a tractor trailer driver um, who was rear-ended by a, pa a, a passenger bus. I, I forget how many passengers were on the bus, but um, so this tractor trailer driver was injured. Um, um, although the trailer took most of the brunt of the impact, um, he had headaches, dizziness, loss of memory, um, and is still suffering the uh, consequences of that collision now. Yeah, you mentioned that these can these can really be life changing for you know for the rest of somebody's life, and they can also be a little bit tricky to diagnose. Are brain injuries always diagnosed right away after an accident, and why or why not? You know, absolutely not. So if there is an obvious physical symptom that we talked about, like you know, someone who has a catastrophic brain injury where they have to have part of their skull removed, that's very obvious. That is a different situation. You'll be in the hospital for months, but potentially you may have to have your part of your skull removed to avoid, uh, to allow the pressure to release. But in a lot of cases, these uh, people who are injured and have a brain injury will go to the emergency room. And at the emergency room, they're not really set up to diagnose and treat a brain injury. So they may be able to treat, uh, they may say concussion, um, but they basically will release you unless it's, you know, they need to keep you in there uh, for emergent because you're, uh, life, it's a life-threatening situation at that moment. So we see repeatedly uh, people who go to the emergency room and then are sent home even the same day and they're told to follow up. Well, they may have headaches and concussion and sometimes it will resolve, but oftentimes the symptoms, uh, not only do they not resolve, but they actually start to show up after they've left the emergency room and after a couple days have passed. So that's when the headaches, the memory problems and other things start surfacing. Um, it's, it can be very difficult to, um, to diagnose that sometimes uh, for the ER department. Like I said, they're not equipped. And that's why it's critical for people who've been injured and had a head injury to go to their doctor and to demand that they uh, get treated and be seen for all of their symptoms. And it's, it's tough because they're not feeling well, they've just been in an accident, but they need to go and see the doctor and let them know about all the symptoms. So keeping a diary or a logbook 
of all the symptoms. It could be that you feel fatigued, um, foggy headed, um, you know, you have ringing in your ears, you may have some confusion. Um, any of those might be some of the symptoms that you would have after suffering a brain injury with no, uh, you know, visible symptoms on the outside, but that you're experiencing these things that potentially can't be diagnosed at the emergency room level. And I think you bring up a really good point because I think a misconception is if you're released from the emergency room, you're okay, but really you, you might not be. Um, what are some of the challenges your clients with brain injuries uh, have experienced and uh, how has this affected them long-term and their families? Sure. It's, you know, it's really tough. And, and uh, one thing that I have dealt with a lot is the frustration, anxiety, and depression of people who've suffered of these brain injuries where Again, you don't see the physical symptoms. Uh, you don't see them. That's why they're described sometimes as invisible injuries. But it has affected this person so completely that they are a changed person. They uh, have bad mood swings, um, and they don't. They can't control them. Sometimes their personality even changes, and other people around them, loved ones, have a very hard time interacting with them after the brain injury. And again, because you can't see the, you can't see the injury on the outside, it's very difficult to deal with. So making sure that you get into treatment and have an understanding that you have been injured, you can't see it, but you can do things to work on it and um, help try to improve it or come up with strategies to deal with it. And if the family members then can get some education and understanding about the brain injury, that will help them understand what's needed for their loved one. And it will help them emotionally deal with, uh, you know, this potentially an, almost a new person uh, who is now in their life. And, you know, typically if you can get the medical care and attention to help the person come up with strategies to deal with it, then that helps everyone in the household and, and helps the loved ones. Yeah, I'm sure that you've personally seen how this impacts entire families. Uh, how can a lawsuit help not just the individual, but also the family? Sure. So a lawsuit really can help because I'll just tell you an example. In, in our cases and some I'm handling now, we will make sure that the plaintiff who's injured um, goes to the best specialists, and those specialists will then put together a plan for what medical care is needed, including whether it's uh, neuropsych testing and evaluation, and then follow-up testing, whether it's additional scans, uh, MRIs, or other things that are needed, not only for now, but in the future to see how that person is progressing. Also, a big part of it is um, counseling and therapy and um, skills and education and training for the plaintiff, uh, the injured person to deal with the brain injury. And then the family and caregivers are alleviated of the burden of, of thinking, what can we do? Because the lawsuit will help get the experts and pay for it so that the uh, injured party can then get better and get back to as close as possible being the best family member. I can imagine how overwhelming it can be for families going through this, not just with the medical component, but also with the legal component. So what should they look for when choosing a lawyer? Sure. There's, you know, there's lots of great lawyers and I'm, it's such an honor to be in this profession. Um, I would say the most important thing to me is obviously you've got to find a competent and qualified lawyer who has dealt with um, people who've suffered traumatic brain injury. And, and second, because this really is an important part of, of life, you really have to find a lawyer that you, that you trust and that you believe really cares about your uh, loved one or about your case um, so that you can have that peace of mind knowing you did the best for your, uh, either for yourself or for your loved one in getting a lawyer who really cares and is really going to go the distance. Um, there are so many different personality types. There really are uh, great lawyers and it really just has to be a good fit. Do you like this person? Do you trust them? 
Um, and do you, uh, you know, have a relationship with them that you feel like this is going to be the person who's really going to look out for your best interest? It was nice to talk to you today. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been lawyer Michelle West. I want to remind you, if you'd like to ask Michelle questions about your situation, go to askthelawyers.com. Click the button at the top of the page that says Ask a Lawyer, and it'll walk you through the very simple process. Thanks for watching. I'm Molly Hendrickson for Ask the Lawyers.